Okay, let's, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to start reviewing this week <clears throat> for the uh, final. So what I thought I'd do is use the quizzes as a uh, guide to uh, review for what we're going to do. So this is proposition, uh, propositional quiz one. And uh, let's take a look at it. So, what does it mean to be a proposition? Do remember the definition? Yes. Is it a statement that can be true or false? Exactly. It's a statement that must be true or false. So, a maybe statement is not going to work, right? So, it's a statement that might be, that has to be true or false. So, it always rains on Tuesday. Is that a proposition? Yes. It is, isn't it? It's false, but it's a proposition, right? Is that a proposition? Tuesday is the day I do my homework. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like if it's a fact, right? It's a fact, then it's a proposition. What about this one? Is this a proposition? Do your homework on Tuesday. No. No, because that's not a true or false statement, is it? It's an order. Okay. So that's not a proposition. What about this one? Here we get into the if statements. If the moon is made of green cheese, then I will do my homework. Is that a proposition? Yes. It is, isn't it? It's not a good statement, maybe. By the way, is that a true or false statement? Um, it, it, it depends on your personal opinion. False? What's the first part? If the moon is made of green cheese, is that true or false? False. false. That's right. false. So what does that make the if statement? True. 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 Remember, that's false the big thing true. we got to remember. In the if statement, if the first part is false, it doesn't matter about the second part. If the first part is false, by definition, the if statement is true. That's not that, well, it was not the question there, but I just want to bring that up. Make sure you remember that. Okay, so... And looking at this, P and <clears throat> not Q implies not P. Hmm. Is that going to be always true? Well, we've got to look at truth tables, don't we? So let's put together a truth table for that. What do we need in the truth table? Well, we need P, we need Q, we need not Q, we need, we need P and not Q, and then we need P and not Q implies not P, right? Shouldn't there also just be one for not P? Yeah, maybe we should have one for not P as well. rows am I going to have? Four. And why are we going to have four? We have, um, because we have two have basic variables, don't we, P and right. Q? Mm -hmm. And so two raised to the second power is four, so we're going to need four. 
So if we take P and Q and set them up first, we can have true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. So that sets up the two basics, right? Now not P, then is the opposite of P, so that's false, <coughs> false, true, true. And not Q is the opposite of Q, so that's false, true, false, true. Now P and not Q. Okay, now an and statement is true when? <coughs> Excuse me, when both of them are true? When both of them are true, otherwise it's <coughs> false. If one of them or both of them are false, it's false, right? Okay, let's change that symbol there. And so we're looking at P and not Q. Okay, we've got a false here, so that makes the and statement false. We've got two T's here, so that's true. We've got two F's, so that's false. And we've got an F here, so that's false. Okay. Now, P and not Q implies not P. Well, let's see. We want to take this and this. So we've got a false implying a false. Is that true or false? A false implying a false? A false implying a false, false. and is false. True. 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 Remember false the if statement implying. I just mentioned a while ago? Okay. If the first part's false, the if statement is true. Okay? So false implying false is true. What about true implying false? False. False. What about false implying true? True. True. And false implying true? True. 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 So now, is the proposition always true? No. No. Because here's the proposition, right? Okay. And here's the case where it's false. The proposition is true when P is false. Well, let's see. When P is false, it's true, isn't it? You see that? Here's the two cases where P is false. The statement is true, isn't it? Okay. Let's look at the others, make sure we're okay there. The proposition is true if P is true and Q is false. Well, here's where P is true and Q is false, but the statement's false, so that doesn't work. The proposition is never true. Yeah, it's true in three cases. So the answer here is the proposition's true when P is false. Yes? How is it that one when on the first line P is true and it's also true? Up here? Yeah. Where P is true, proposition is true. But what did we say about the answer? What about that, Will? Does that violate one of those? I mean, our answer we went with was the proposition is true when P is false. Right. And there P is true, Here's but the proposition is, is still true. Okay. So where P is false, the proposition is true, right? So it's just not, not specific about the whole line. It's just saying for those specific two, because it's talking about... The pro yeah, it's saying right? the proposition is true... I'm sorry, right here. The proposition is true when P is false. So I want to look at where P is false. Okay. 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 All right. Anybody else concerned with that? Okay. All right. And then I believe the way that we <coughs> put the answers in here, we actually show the truth tables, right? But the proposition is always true is not right. The proposition is true when P is false. Here's where P is false, the proposition is true. So that would be your answer. Use a truth table to determine which of the following is true for this proposition. Not P or not Q implies not P. Let's see if we can use the one we've got. We've got not P, not Q. What we need is changing this one and changing this one. 
So we have not P or not Q, and we want to have not P or not Q implies not P. Now, it changes the truth tables for these two columns to change their values. Okay. Now, an OR statement. <clears throat> when is an OR statement true? When one or the other is true. When one or the other is true, right? Or another way of saying is, it's only false when both are false, isn't it? Okay. So let's take a look at not P and the not Q column. Here they're both false, so that would make that false. Here we have one of them true. Here we have one of them true. Here we have both of them true. So there is the uh, column for not P or not Q. Now, we want to look at this column implying not P. Okay? Now here's a false implying a false. Is that true or false? <clears throat> a false implies a false. Is true. that true or false? True. It's true, right? Because of what we said about the if statement. True implying false. Hmm. What's that? False. That's false. That's the one case where an if statement is false. True implying true. True implying true. Okay. So, in the answers, the proposition's never true. Well, no, we showed it's true in three cases. The proposition is false when P is false. So here's where we said the proposition is false. And oh, he's true over here in that row. The proposition is always true? No. The proposition is false if P is true and Q is false. Well, here's where P is true and Q is false and the proposition is false. So the proposition is false when P is true and Q is false. So anyway, see how that works. That's the important thing. See how it works. Okay. And then what you want to do is look for the answer that demonstrates that same choice. Table to determine which of the following is true for this proposition. P and Q or P implies not P. Well, we're going to need a little more room up here. <coughs> so, let's put in this column here. Let's put um, Q or P, and then let's put P and Q or P, and then we'll have the final one, which is P and Q or P implies not P. Okay. Q or P, that's an OR statement, right? We just said it's only false when both are false. So we go back to the, to the Q or P or the P or Q column, which is here and here, and we find they're both true in this row, so that's true. One is true and one is false, but that's okay for an OR statement, it's still true. False and false, whoops, I'm in the wrong one here. True, false and true, that's true. And then false or false is false. So there is the Q or P. Now, an AND statement, remember, it's true only when both are true, right? So I want to look at where P and this statement I just uh, evaluated are both true at the same time. Well, here they're both true. Here they're both true. Here we've got a false, and in fact, down here we have a false, okay? 
Now, we're looking at this statement implying not P. Here's my not P column. And remember that an if statement is false when this is true implying a false. So let's look at it. Here we have true implying false. Right away, we've got a false situation. True implying false, again, is false. False implying true, that's okay. And false implying true, that's okay. Okay. Gee, isn't that column identical to this column? Let's see what happens. The proposition is false if P is true. Well, here's where P is true, and sure enough, that's when the statement is false, isn't it? So the first one makes sense, but let's make sure we don't have two that say the same thing. The proposition is never true. Well, no, it's true down there. The proposition is false when P is false. But well, here's where P is false, the proposition's true. So that's not it. The proposition's always true. No, it's not always true. So the only one that fits is the proposition is false when P is true. Okay. Okay. here is they've made this a not P and of course that's a not P so we can just change those two columns all right so now we have not P and Q or P remember it's an and which is true only when both are true so we've got not P and Q or P well, here, we've got a false here, so that's false. We still have a false there, so that's false. Here we have two T's, so that's true. Here we've got one false, so that's false. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we've got this implying not P. But remember, that implication is only false when they've got a true implying a false. Okay. So we have a false here. That's true. Got a false here. That's true. Here we have a true implying a true. That's true. And here we have a false again. Uh-uh. It's always true. So if I agree with that? Okay. So now, when you look over here, the proposition is false when P is false. Well, no, the proposition was never false. The proposition is always true. There's your answer. Proposition never true. The proposition is false if P is true and Q is false. Okay. Proposition is always true. Okay. All right. Any questions on evaluating using truth tables? Does that bring it back for you? Okay. <clears throat> now validity. Let's talk about what validity means and how we use it. <clears throat> validity has to do with arguments and it's a good skill to actually learn when somebody gives you some facts that <coughs> they think are facts and want to make a conclusion from it you can argue their facts but a lot of times that doesn't go over very well however if you can show that if their facts are true their conclusion doesn't follow then they've got to agree with you, right? Even if their facts are false. So, in an argument, validity says you assume that the given statements are true. 
and you then show whether or not the conclusion follows. Or sometimes you've got to figure out which are the givens and which is the following. So, if there's a tractor-trailer accident on I-75, Highway 41 is blocked. Highway 41 is blocked. Therefore, now therefore is the giveaway, because what follows the therefore is the conclusion. Therefore, there is a tractor-trailer accident on I-75. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this is true and this is true, and when both of those are true, looking across the rows now, we're going to see whether or not this is always true, when those two are true. Okay? So we need to create then a truth table for that situation. We really only have two things, don't we? Tractor trailer accident on a 75 and 41 blocked. Okay. So we could say we've got accident and we've got blocked. And you can use letters of your own. I think we did this differently before. Um, and then we say, if there's a tractor-trailer accident on 75, Highway 41 is blocked. Well, that means that A implies blocked, right? Accident implies blocked. And we've already got the Highway 41 is blocked. Uh, therefore, there is an accident on 75. I think we have everything we need right here. So let's see. We only have two basics, so that means we have four rows. Now, A implies B. Well, this is false only when we have a true implying a false, right? So where this is true implying a false is right here, so that's the false. Otherwise, true implying true is okay, and any time the first part's false, your statement is true. Now, we only want to look at where this is true and this is true, right? Because we said that those are the two givens. <coughs> the if statement is one of the givens, and Highway 41 is blocked is one of the givens. So we want to look at where those two are true at the same time. Well, here they're true at the same time. So I put a little arrow here just to remind us of that. Here they're true at the same time. And that's it, those two. Now the conclusion is that there's an accident on I-75. So what that means is both of these rows where I said these are true, there must be an accident. So going over to accidents, there is up here, but there's not down here. You see how that works now? It says your argument isn't true. Because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. If I see that okay? Okay. Now, when you really put that together, let's say you had that argument, and I came back and said, well, wait a minute, what if there's an accident on 41? Wouldn't 41 be blocked? But there's no accident on 75, is there? Or there's maintenance or uh, construction on 41? Now here we change it, a similar situation, but we've changed it a little bit. Here we're saying, if there's a tractor-trailer accident on I-75, I-75 is blocked and Highway 41 is blocked. And then we say Highway 41 is not blocked, and the conclusion, therefore, there's no tractor-trailer accident on I-75. How many basic, um, basic propositions do we have now? We have three, don't we? We have accident on 75, we have 75 blocked, and we have 41 blocked. Okay? So that changes things. So let's change this, where's that, okay, 
So let's put uh, 75 for 75 block and 41 for 41 block, okay? And then we need um, if there's a tractor trailer, yeah, okay. So if there's a tractor trailer X to I-75, I-75 is blocked and 41 is blocked. So accident implies 75 and 41, right? Well, let's see. I guess we need to do that one first. So let's do 75 and 41. And then we'll do accident implies 75 and 41. Okay? Now, should I have done not 41? Probably, shouldn't I? As we said, 41's not blocked. Okay, so let's just put, split this column here. Okay. So, how many rows did we say we needed? We have three. So we need how many rows? So we need eight. Eight, right. It's two to the power of how many we had. So two to the third <coughs> is eight. So we take the first row and make half of them trues and half of them false. With the second one, we want to go split this in half so we'd have two T's and two F's two T's and two F's, and then we go every other one. Now not 41, it's going to be the opposite of 41, so that's F T, F T, F T, F T. Now 75 and 41, it's an and statement. So it's true only when both are true. So looking at uh, 75 and 41, that's these two columns here. They're both true here, but now we have a false and a false and two falses. And we have two T's again, and then we have a false and a false and two falses, okay? So it's only true here and here. Okay. Now we can look at accident implies 75 and 41 are blocked. Now, for this if statement, it's false only when this is true and that is false, right? So let's look at that. Here we have a T and a T, so that's true. Here we have a T and an F, so that's false. Here we have a T and an F, so that's false. Here we have a T and an F, so that's false. Here we have a false implying a true, but that's true. In fact, these last four are true because the accident is false, and false implying anything is true. Okay. okay. So now what we want to do is we want to look at where this one is true, and Highway 41 is not blocked, is true, okay? Because those are the two givens. If there's a tractor-trailer accident, it must be true, and Highway 41 is not blocked, it must be true. Okay, so now we're looking at this column and this column for T's on both of them. Well, here we don't have it. This is a T, but this is an F. So we come down here. Here's a T and an F. Here's a T and a T. And here is a T and a T. Okay. Here and here are the two rows where both of the givens are true. So what's our conclusion? There's no tractor-trailer accident on I-75. So A must be false on both of those rows, correct? And as I look at them, coming across, there's no accident, and there's 
no accident. Therefore, that argument is valid. Okay? Now, let's think about it. It really has nothing to do with I-75 being blocked, by the way, does it? We could have left that one off, but because we want to look at everything, we didn't do that. But the statement says clearly that if there's an accident on 75, 41 will be blocked, right? Isn't that clear? So if 41's not blocked, there can't be an accident on 75. Now, we can argue the statement, though, can't we? That the accident on 75 could be a minor fender bender, and they moved it over to the side, and it hasn't affected the traffic on 41. You can argue that, but the person you're dealing with may not like your argument, right? Mm -hmm. But when you show them something like this, okay, all right. In this case, the person was correct. All right. Is everybody comfortable now with propositional logic? Okay. So. These questions, or a version of these questions, or something like these questions, may show up on the final. So you want to make sure you can do these. All right. One, we'll be careful we see this on the final. Remember what this x situation is up here. It doesn't mean that x is the only variable that can be used for students, or x is the only variable that can be used for books, or we'd be in trouble, wouldn't it? So if we're going to see those in a sentence or in a uh, predicate expression, just remember that it's whatever is in the parentheses. It could be a Y, it could be an M, or an N, or a B, or an S, or anything, all right? Means that that thing, whatever it is, is a student. So this is kind of like a legend or a key on a map. <coughs> okay? So we want to write out in prepositional logic, symbolic, symbolic language, each student likes a book that he or she owns. Now, when you're using each student, is that going to be a for all or there exists? For all. It's for all, okay? Remember that for all or for each means the same thing. So we know that it starts with a for all. Now, looking at our answers down here, we would throw this one out, wouldn't we? Here they've tried to assign x to students, but they don't tell us if we're talking about all x's or some x's, right? So this one has not set up the variable correctly. Just like in a language, you want to make sure you're setting up your variables correctly. Let's pull up all the answers. So we know that these three are starting off correctly. Um, and these all start with, for all x, where x is a student, right? right? It implies there exists an x where x is a book. What's wrong with that? Where are you using? Yeah, we've misunderstood the key, haven't we? Be 
because we reassigned X to be books, but X are students. So this is not the right one. What about this one? For all X, where X is a student, it implies there exists a Y where Y is a book, and the student owns the book, and the student likes the book. Is that the right thing? Yes. yes. OK. Let's see what's wrong with the last one. For all X, where X is a student, it implies there exists a Y where Y is a book, and the student likes the book. It doesn't say anything about owning the book, does it? And we wanted to make sure that they own it. So this would be the right answer. You probably remember following that now? Okay. All right. likes it. So, is this about one student or all students? This is one where we had to lay out a law, right? This is talking about a typical student, right? So therefore we're talking about all students. Even though it looks like a student would be there exists. When you're putting a law about all students, just making a statement that if a student if a student owns a book, he or she likes it, we're really saying that's true for any student, or we, we're assuming that we're uh, uh, asserting that it does. Okay? So this is a for all situation. Uh, this one, we forgot to set up the for all or there exists, so that's not a good one. But how about this? For all x and for all x, where x is a student and x is a book. There's that problem again. Right, that's not it. For all x and for all y, where x is a student and y is a book, it implies that the student owns the book and the student likes the book. Is that what we said? If the student owns a book, he or she likes it. Okay. How about this? For all X and for all Y, where X is a student, Y is a book, and the student owns the book, that implies that the student likes the book. Which one is correct? The third one or the fourth one? The fourth one, right? Because notice, the if the student owns the book, that's part of the first part of the implication. That implies they like it. That would be this one. Okay? Everybody see that? There's where you probably have to go back and check what the first one, what the statement said to make sure. All right. about all books. No, this is a there exists, isn't it? Okay. So, we're going to say there exists a book. Is this true for all students? When you say no student, aren't you talking about all students? All students don't like it, basically, or no student likes it. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can figure out which one this would be. There exists an X where X is a book. And for all x, where x, oops, that's doubling the x's again. There exists a y where y is a book, and for all x, where x is a student, the student doesn't like it. Okay? Let's see. There's a book that no student likes. That's reasonable, isn't it? But let's see if there's a better one. Down here, we didn't do it for each or for all. Down here, for 
there exists a y where y is a book, and for all x, where x is not a student, oh, maybe x is a car, right? This is not going to give it. This. So this is the one. Right? For all students, they don't like that book. That's another way of saying no students do like the book, right? right. Any questions on that one? It's getting a little more awkward, isn't it? And that's a good example, by the way, of uh, if you are <coughs> given uh, an assignment to do a program, to program something, and somebody else is doing the same assignment, and you look at the way they did it, sometimes it can be the backwards from what you did, but both are correct, right? does not like at least one book. So we're talking about all students? Yeah, every is all, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> Are we talking about all books? Well, it's pretty obvious that we're talking about at least one, right? There exists. So, for all x, where x is a student, implies there exists a y, where y is a book, and the book doesn't like the student. Uh-oh. Be very careful how you read these. Remember this? Because sometimes they're going to be switch, switched. So this was not right. For all x, there exists an a. There's that double x thing again. For all x, there exists a y, where x is a student, implies y is a book, and the student doesn't like the book. That sounds somewhat reasonable, but let's see what this one says. For all x, where x is a student, implies there exists a y, where y is a book, and the student doesn't like the book. Now, what's the difference between this one and this one? The third one says that all students don't like the same book. Exactly. That is the difference. When you put the, there exists up here, you're saying that this Y is the Y we're going to talk about for all students. We're down here. This student now exists. This student, for each student that we have, there could be a different book. It's a subtle difference, but that's the difference between this one and this one. Okay? And by the statement up here, every student does not like at least one book. I would say the implication there is it could be a different book for each student. Okay. So this one down here is the best answer. a book, but there is no book that all students own. So we're talking about all students, aren't we? Um, are we talking about all books? Well, let's see. For all x, where x is a student, it implies there exists a y, where y is a book, and the student owns the book. That sounds good so far, doesn't it? And in fact, I think it's repeated exactly on all of these, isn't it? No, down here we have the xx problem. But here, and here, and here, I think they're all the same. Okay. So it's really the second half that we need to look at. But there is no book that all students own. Well, let's see. The first one says, and there exists a y where y is a book, and there does not exist for all x 
Well, let's see. If, if it's not for all x, where x is a student, x owns y, that's the log for it. Because x's are not, maybe not existent at all. But how about down here? There does not exist a y where y is a book. So what is the y? Where, for all x, x is a student, x owns y. Well, that may be it. Let's see down here. The third one down here says there exists a y where y is not a book. Well, that's even worse. Because there exists a y, but y is not a book. What is y? So this one is the better answer. There does not exist a y where y is a book, and for all x, the student owns the book. There is no book. There does not exist a book that all students own. There does not exist a y where y is a book, and for all students, the student owns that book. Okay. So that one's a little tougher to read through. Uh, the recommendation is read all the answers. Okay? Come up with the best one. Which means you've got to be fairly fluent on being able to read these things, right? Otherwise, they're pretty awkward. Or can be. Right, let's do one more, and then we'll do the rest on Wednesday. If a student likes a book, he or she owns it. Is this again a statement about all students? <clears throat> yeah, aren't we just kind of putting out a rule or a statement? If a student likes a book, doesn't that, we're trying to say that's true for all students, aren't we? Okay. So this is an all. Okay. So for all x and for all y, where x is student, y is a book, and the student likes the book, it implies the student owns the book, right? That sounds pretty good so far, doesn't it? Let's see down here. For all x, for all x, again, that's the xx problem. This one's not a sign. For all x, where x is a student, and y is a book, but wait a minute. We didn't say whether it's all y or there exists a y. So the only one that makes sense is right here. For all x, I'm sorry, right here. For all x and for all y, where x is a student, y is a book, and the student likes the book, the student knows the book. Okay. That's the cleanest one. 